webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah Hartzig from the Kansas Health Institute, and I will be your facilitator. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by the Health Impact Project, a collaboration between the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, the Kansas Health Institute is privileged to be a part of these efforts and host the webinar. Um, I am going to go ahead and mute all the participants. Uh, so your microphones are. You have been be muted. Uh, your microphone has been turned the on. Webinar. However, uh, if you have questions or feedback, please type it into the chat box, which you can see up on your screen here. Additionally, at the end, we are going to open up the phone lines for discussion and questions. Um, so please sit tight and uh, just go ahead and ask questions through the chat box as you have them throughout the webinar. The goal of today's webinar is to build on our previous training, which helped grantees understand the line between lobbying and non-lobbying. Now that you have some background on the topic, we want to share some practical advice about how to make your HIAs as effective as possible at driving smart public policy without crossing the line into being lobbying. The training isn't about what you can't do, uh, although it is important that you don't violate the lobbying restriction in your grant. Uh, instead, today's training is about what you can do, We'll be offering specific steps to take to be savvy, strategic public policy advocates. Our trainer today is Alan Madison, a lawyer in Washington, D.C., who works with nonprofit groups on lobbying rules, fundraising, and tax exemption issues. Alan helps the Health Impact Project's grantees as part of an innovative partnership created by Pew and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as KHI. It's designed to give Health Impact Project grantees the training to know how to maximize their advocacy and also how to have office hours, and also to have office hours where grantees are able to call Alan and ask specific questions or problems that you might be facing. So in today's training, Alan's going to give a brief overview of the lobbying rules uh, to refresh your memories from the last time, and then we'll walk through some hypothetical situations to apply the rules to real life uh, so you can kind of get an example of uh, how to attack specific issues. And then Allison will answer any questions that you might have, and that's when we'll open the phone lines back up to the audience. Again, please note for anyone who's joined us uh, since we've muted the lines that we have muted all the lines. We'll unmute all of you as we move into the interactive part of the webinar, and we encourage you to ask any questions you might have currently via the chat box or um, at the end over the phone. For your convenience, we've included the phone number for the meeting up in the notes section. Uh, if you are just joined by Adobe and you'd like to join via phone to interact verbally, um, please go ahead and dial that number. It's 888-579-6956. Uh, you can also use the chat box for your questions during the discussion section. All right, so I think that's all the housekeeping I have. And with that, I will let Alan take it away. Oh, thanks so much, Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, and Sarah, if you could make me the presenter, that would be, we need to go ahead and do that step. Yes, um, got it. So today's presentation is, a, as Sarah mentioned, building on the presentation that we did earlier in the year. Uh, and basically, this presentation today is to help us understand what exactly can we do with these HIAs now that the HIAs are nearing their release stage. It's a time to start thinking strategically about how we're going to release the HIAs, how they're going to be used in, their, in your communities, and how we can make them as impactful as possible with uh, policymakers and legislators and uh, folks in the executive branch of the state and local governments that you're working with. And also how, for those HIAs that aren't focused on uh, an impact that will have a governmental role, how can we use government officials as allies to help strengthen the impact that an HIA on an institutional actor, uh, how can we make that as impactful as possible? So as Sarah mentioned, we'll talk about the lobbying rules briefly. And then we're going to talk more in depth about the key exceptions that are really important for grantees to understand. There are a couple of key exceptions that you can leverage to really use your HIAs to uh, go a lot farther in influencing policy than a lot of people really um, expect. And then the last thing is we're going to talk about some real world situations. And what I've done in the real world situations is I've created hypotheticals 
that we'll work through. And I just want to be clear that all of the hypotheticals are drawn directly from my conversations with HIP grantees, uh, but I'm, I've made them sort of an, an, um, anonymous so that no one's going to be uh, singled out as, oh, this is something that so-and-so did in this state and it was totally you know, ridiculous or this was something that someone else asked. I think it's really important that when I'm working with you all as grantees that there's a degree of confidentiality, you know, that it's, it's completely confidential so that I'm not telling your funders, hey, you know, a grantee from this state doesn't really understand the rules and you're in jeopardy when you fund them. The way we've set up this program is creating a safe environment where grantees can ask me questions to get important information without having any kind of a fear that I'd be telling the, um, the folks who are making the funding decisions at KHI or Pew or Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, you know, what sort of questions people have um, specifically. So that's one way that we've set this up to protect all of you. So just to dive into the review, as you know, Section C3, 501c3 charities can do lobbying, but private foundations, so public charities can do lobbying up to a limited amount, but private foundations can't directly pay for lobbying. They can't earmark grants for it. And Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has included in this grant a restriction on conducting any lobbying whatsoever. So to the extent that you're using the HIP grant, you can't conduct any lobbying. To the extent that you have other funds, go ahead and lobby with those other funds as long as they're not subject to restrictions. Account for your time accordingly so that the HIP grant isn't paying for the lobbying. And more importantly, understand the rules that we're going to be talking about today so that you can save your lobbying dollars for when they're going to have the biggest, um, the biggest bang for the buck so that you can use non-lobbying dollars to get right up, get your toes right up to that line, save your lobbying dollars for when you really need them. Or to the extent that, you know, if you don't have any lobbying money available, understand how you can create an environment using the rules so that other coalition allies can pick up the ball and run with it in a lobbying context so that you're creating an environment where they're going to be successful at their lobbying. And keep in mind that this presentation only talks about the IRS restrictions. Uh, there are lots of state and local lobbying restrictions that you need to pay attention to. And it may be, and this is uh, frequently the case, that there are activities that the state law says are lobbying that IRS says are not lobbying, in particular working on regulations and, and the executive branch act activities are not lobbying for IRS purposes, but they might be lobbying under your state law purposes. These restrictions, you can use HIP grant funds. I can't emphasize this enough. Go ahead and use your HIP grant funds for anything that the IRS says is non-lobbying. Even if it's reportable to your state as a state lobbying activity, it's still OK to use your HIP grant for that activity. So what is lobbying? A lot of people use the phrase advocacy or lobbying to mean the same thing. And there's a really important distinction. Advocacy is a broad range of activities. It's any kind of, as Mer Merriman Webster defines it, anything that's supporting a cause or proposal. So education is advocacy. Working to get the public to support a public policy position is advocacy. Telling legislators to pass a bill is advocacy. Everything is advocacy. We want you to do a lot of advocacy. The only thing that you can't use the HIP grants for is lobbying. And the Internal Revenue Code, Section 501c3 and related provisions and regulations, specifically define lobbying as influence to in efforts to influence legislation. And it talks about two types of lobbying. There's direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying. Direct lobbying influences lawmakers directly. And grassroots lobbying uses communications with the public to get lawmakers to do what you want them to do. 
So direct lobbying has three elements. It's a communication directly with a legislator or staff member on specific legislation and reflects the organization's view on that legislation. This is something we've been through in the previous webinar. And the key here, remember, is if your communication leaves off any of these prongs, it's not direct lobbying. So as we said, it's a communication directly with legislators or staff members. So this is only face-to-face -face meetings, emails, a phone call. If you put up a big billboard outside of a legislator's office that says, pass HB 26, that's not a direct lobbying communication, even though you know the legislator is going to see it every time they walk in and out of their office because this billboard is across the street from their office. It's just not a direct lobbying communication. It's a communication with the public when you put up that big billboard. So we're really only talking about communications where you're sending them a letter or meeting with them in their office or meeting with them on the street. It could even be meeting them in the grocery store. Um, it also involves executive branch officials or staff, but only to the extent the executive branch official is formulating the le legislation. So for example, a communication with the governor's budget advisor about the state budget proposal would fall into this category. It's a communication with a legislator or staff on specific legislation. And specific legislation is bills that have been introduced. That's obvious. It also includes specific legislative proposals that aren't yet introduced. And this is really the important part for HIP grantees. Because often, an HIA will be written about a specific legislative proposal. It hasn't been introduced yet. But the IRS says that if there's enough specificity that the legislator knows what they should introduce, that falls into this category of covered as a um, communication with a legislator on specific legislation. So for example, if you told a legislator, we need to uh, lower the speed limit across our state to 55 miles an hour, that would be a specific legislative proposal if it could only be accomplished legislatively and not through regulation by the DOT. Um, another example would be uh, New Jersey should adopt Pennsylvania's healthy food financing law. You know, that way, if the New Jersey legislators would know specifically what law to introduce. They would be saying, OK, we'll, we'll pull over the language that Pennsylvania has in their statute. But when you're talking generally about policy issues or policy proposals, you can communicate with legislators about general policy without it being direct lobbying as long as it's not a specific legislative proposal. And for your purposes, it's important to recognize legislation does not include regulatory actions, executive actions, corporate actions. Um, and these are all things that you might be writing an HIA on. And you can talk to a legislator about a corporate action. Or you know, for example, if you're doing an um, a, a urban planning HIA that involves a zoning board decision but doesn't involve any um, legislative decisions by the city council, you could talk to city council members about the results of your HIA without it being uh, direct lobbying. Last of all, so it's a communication with a legislator or staff member on specific legislation, and it has to reflect the organization's viewpoint. Now, it's going to be really rare that any communication you have with a legislator is going to be totally content neutral. And if you think that you have figured out a way to be totally neutral in your communication, let's talk about it. Because very often I get clients who think they can be cute and think they can dance around this one. They're going to talk about legislation with a legislator, but they're going to be neutral. They're just an issue expert on this, giving neutral information. Uh-uh-uh. It doesn't work that way. And um, there's a wide swath of activity that the IRS would view as reflecting the organization's viewpoint that falls short of saying, vote for or vote against this bill. So that's, that's direct lobbying. Direct lobbying is a communication directly with legislators or staff on specific legislation and it reflects the viewpoint. And we'll circulate these slides. And I'll send out a cheat sheet as well with uh, these rules delineated so that you don't need to be scribbling madly to take notes. Now, grassroots lobbying is a communication to the public on specific legislation that reflects the organization's viewpoint. 
and it has to include a call to action. So what do we mean by a call to action? The most obvious one is saying, contact Senator so-and-so and tell her to do blank. When you ask your audience to contact their legislator, that's the most obvious call to action. But the IRS has another number of other prongs that you'll see here that also involve a call to action, where basically the IRS is preventing you from circumventing that rule. Because it was, if it was as simple as saying, contact Senator so-and-so, we'd come up with all sorts of ways to get around that. So if you provide a vehicle for contacting them, if you identify an individual as being the audience's legislator, if you identify them as being a member of the committee that's going to vote on the upcoming legislation or provide their contact information, all of those things give the audience, give the public, enough of a nudge that they think, hey, I should pick up the phone and give that person a call, let them know what I think about the legislation. Similarly, if you identify a legislator as being neutral or opposed to your position on the legislation, that counts as being a call to action. So for example, if that billboard outside of the legislator's office said, Senator Smith is on the fence about HB 26, that, which will protect your families from toxic harm, you think, hey, Senator Smith is on the fence. I'd better give them a call and let Senator Smith know that I think we need to pass HB 26. Whereas if you identify Senator Smith as being supportive of the legislation and supportive of your position, no one's going to think, oh, they're already on the right position, they're already in the right place, I'd better give them a call and tell them that they need to vote for this. So that's one little nuance that we'll pick up on later on in our discussion. So that's it, those are the basic rules. They're relatively simple as applied, but you know, let's think through what isn't lobbying. Here are some important exceptions, and if we can walk through these exceptions, stepping carefully on these beautiful stepping stones in the creek, we can get through, get our message across to legislators and other public officials with the with the HIP grant money without it being viewed as being lobbying, and we're able to advance our public policy issues uh, a lot more effectively. The first one we want to talk about is the subsequent use rule. Under the subsequent use rule, it says that if you use your educational materials, such as um, you know, an HIA that's purely educational, not lobbying, but if you use those materials for lobbying at any point, the, H, the IRS is going to presume that they were created for a lobbying purpose. Now, you can rebut that presumption by demonstrating that the materials were used for non-lobbying activities first, and that your initial non-lobbying basically outweighed anything that happened subsequently that was a lobbying activity. And so what the goal here is, if you create educational materials, and they might be used for lobbying later on down the line, you want to demonstrate to the IRS that you got these educational materials out really broadly, and that giving them to legislators was totally de minimis in comparison. So think through how you, what audiences you can get your materials out to. And this is going to have, obviously, two really salutary benefits. The first is we protect the organization from this subsequent use rule in case anyone uses your HIA later on for lobbying, you're able to say, look, we got this materials out broadly to the public first, it's not lobbying. And more, almost more importantly, by doing these things, you're going to get a big audience for your health impact assessment, and you're going to get a lot more public support and public interest. So do a briefing for academics on the issue. Provide copies of this to public health experts. Think through who it is that's paying attention to this issue across the board, get them copies, get them materials, sit down with them. Do outreach to all sorts of new constituencies, physicians. Often people overlook getting HIAs out to the very people who might care most about this, the medical community. PTAs are going to care. Business leaders are going to care about this. Think through a broad panoply of people that you can get these materials out to. And then, of course, do media outreach. This is an example um, of a media outreach plan that a client of mine did where they 
wrote talking points for all of their coalition allies to use with the media. They provided all the coalition allies with sample Facebook posts and sample tweets. They actually did six, six tweets and six Facebook posts, and all the coalition allies posted or tweeted about this in the week after the, the uh, educational report was released. And, you know, think about it. The other nonprofits are thrilled to have ready-made content. Everyone, everyone is thirsty for content. And so by giving your allies content for social media, it accomplishes a couple of things. They're happy with you. They rely on you more. You become viewed as a more of a credible source in the community. You're driving people to see and learn about your HIA, so more people are going to read it rather than having it sit on a shelf somewhere. And you're also able to demonstrate to the IRS how many people saw this. You're able to say, look, we got 62,500 impressions on Twitter because we had these nine different organizations tweeting about it. You know, we had all, you know, 125 likes on the Facebook page, et cetera all of which demonstrates that you had this broad public release that far outweighed the amount of activity that you're having, you know, providing it to some legislators. Sit down with editorial page writers so that the editorial page writers can really understand this, get a real, really strong briefing. Bring news camera crews for, to shoot B-roll so that they can do stories when it comes time to do uh, when, as your issue is moving on through the legislative cycle, if you bring them on a media tour to get what's called B-roll of the areas that are going to be impacted by your HIA, you're also able to communicate the important substantive messages of your HIA to the reporters who are going to be on that media tour. Letters to the editor and op-eds are also important. And last of all, talk radio. When you get Talk radio producers, well, first of all, talk radio producers are desperate to fill airtime. They always need experts to fill an hour in the afternoon or 45 minutes in the morning drive time. And they love controversial topics. And you know, often experts might want to shy away from talk radio, but it's a great opportunity for getting your message out, for driving and shaping the public conversation about your issues. And also, you're able to demonstrate to the IRS look, we were on such and such radio station for 45 minutes during drive time one morning and had 125,000 uh, impressions on talk radio. So the fact that we distributed 55 copies of the Capitol building pales in comparison. So using the subsequent use rule is really important. And the way you should think about the subsequent use rule is think through the suite of materials that you can be creating now when you release your HIA, rather than trying to produce something later on down the line. So for example, when you release your HIA, release a one-page fact sheet along with it. Produce an executive summary that's not full of jargon. Think through what materials are my coalition allies going to ask me for six months or 18 months down the line. Now, often the HIA is being written at a pretty early stage in the legislative process. But we know that the advocacy groups on these issues are going to be asking you for an FAQ page that they can bring on lobby day when they have a lobby day on this issue next June or next March. We know that your issue is going to be coming up. It's going to be hotly debated in the legislature coming up in March. And you know that you're going to be having questions come at you from legislators who aren't going to, and staffers who frankly just don't have the time to sit down and read a 55-page health impact assessment. And they're going to be stumbling if the executive summary is full of jargon. So it's important to get a one-page or two-page fact sheet prepared now for those people. Because if the legislator calls you in March, you know, the sponsor of your bill calls you in March and says, hey, I love the HIA, but can you write me a summary that I can give to my colleagues? If they ask for that in March and you write it for them then, that's a lobbying expense, and you need to use lobbying funds for that. You can't use your HIP grant for that activity. But if they call you in March and say, hey, 
I want to give a summary to all of my colleagues. I thought the HIA was really important. And you released such a summary at the same time you released the HIA and distributed that summary on your website. You can just say to that legislative sponsor, yeah, I'd love it if you used our summary. It's up on the website. Go to and gave your website address. So think through what long-term needs you can fulfill now and use that subsequent use rule to your benefit. Another important exception is the nonpartisan analysis study and research exception. Basically what that says is if you produce research materials that are balanced and have a full and fair examination of both sides that provide an independent objective analysis, then it's okay to say that you favor one side or another and it's still not going to be lobbying. The problem here is you need to produce it in a way that a reasonable reader can say, you know what, I disagree with what they've said. I've, they have all of the facts here laid out on both sides of the issue, and I come down on the other side. I know that they come and say that we need legislation, but you know, reading through all of these facts and reading the counter arguments that were included in this HIA, I come out on the other side. Often, HIP grantees believe that because they are writing a robust report, it qualifies for this exception. Very often, though, these HIAs are too biased to qualify for the nonpartisan analysis study and research exception. They're just not, um, they're just not um, independent enough, and that's fine. We don't necessarily want them to qualify for this. We don't necessarily want them to be that objective. It's, more, it's a lot more effective to use the subsequent use rule and to have your HIA be written in a way that's going to advocate for one side or another more strongly than would qualify for this exception. The last exception I want to mention is the one for technical advice or assistance. And this is oral or written assistance that you provide in response to a request from a governmental body or, for example, a legislative committee. The key here is that the request has to be on behalf of the whole committee. It can't just be from one member. It can't be from you know, some backbencher who's always been passionate on your issue. You need to get a request written from the committee chair. Now, often I get people say, well, you know, the committee has held the, you know, the majority is the party that opposes us. We'll never get a letter like this. And that's not usually the case. Usually, professional courtesy directs that if any member asks the chair, hey, I'd like such and such expert to testify at the hearing, generally professional courtesy will extend to that request and they'll just process one of these letters. Because the people who are in the majority now know that they may be in the majority next session. On these letters, there's, there's some very specific IRS requirements that you need to follow. And so, Talk to me about getting one of these letters because you need, you know, for example, this letter that I'm showing on the screen is one that I wrote uh, for a lobbyist at the American Heart Association whom I represent. They just took this letter. They sent it on to Senator Dibble's chief of staff who put it on this letterhead and chief of staff sent right back to the lobbyist the letter that I had written. But it's so important that you get this letter in advance. It, it, it's Essentially, it's like Willy Wonka's golden ticket, but it's not a retroactive get-out-of-jail-free card. You need this golden ticket before you go to testify. And keep in mind, there's a huge amount of costs involved with testifying, so it's really important that you be able to testify using HIP grant funds and that you don't have to waste lobbying funds for testifying. If you have one of these golden tickets, you can use your HIP grant fund for all of the time you're going to spend writing and researching and drafting that testimony. Going to the state capitol, you might need travel budget. You might need a hotel night for your testimony. But as long as you have one of these golden tickets, all of that can be paid for with non-lobbying funds. And this advice has to be given to everybody on the committee. It needs to be broadly available. It's not the kind of thing you can just give to folks who are on one side of the issue. So that's, that's sort of a relatively quick run through, and I hope that folks were able to follow along 
as I know I was moving pretty quickly. Um, but that's a quick run through of the issues. What I'd like to do now is move into some hypothetical examples. As I said, these are not always uh, you know, truly hypothetical because a lot of you have been confronted with these directly. But here's how we're going to do this. I'll talk through these hypotheticals, and then I'd like you to write in your chat box whether you think it's lobbying or not lobbying, and a brief explanation, perhaps, of why you think it is lob lobbying or not lobbying. And I'd like to then call on a couple of people to expand a little bit on their answers, because I find that it's always these discussions illuminate um, people's thinking behind these things. So I'm hoping that folks will be willing to unmute their lines. We, I think we'll probably go ahead and unmute everybody, and then we can um, have a little bit of a discussion about these issues. So on this first one, we've got an electric meeting, electric metering um, HIA about pricing and technology. And the nonprofit that does the HIA presents its findings to the Public Utility Commission that's going to set the regulations regarding smart metering. Um, and then only after it presents its findings to the PUC does it distribute the HIA to the public. So let's uh, see if a f couple of people are willing to chime in and whether or not they f think that's lobbying and why. Give you guys another minute or so. And uh, let's see, one more command. Um, Andy, why don't you uh, expand a little bit, Andy Wessel, if you could expand a little bit on your answer, that'd be terrific. Sure. Um, you mentioned that you know groups that are you know decision-making bodies, but that their their job is regulatory in nature, and you cited the example of like a you know a zoning board that that's not considered lobbying because it's not a legislative body. Um, you know they're not. The passing regulations, not legislation. So that's that's why where I thought that came in. That that's actually that's exactly right. That's a good analysis. The direct lobbying is a communication with a legislator on specific legislation, and regulations aren't legislation. That's just uh, you know how the IRS defines it. Regulatory ma matters aren't legislation. So the fact that it uh, was presented to them before it was distributed to the public doesn't matter because your you know, regulation, as soon as it's about regulation, all bets are off. It's just not lobbying. Now, one of the tricky things here that a lot of people um, frequently have misconceptions on is whether or not the people are elected officials. And Max had mentioned that as an issue. And that's a common question that sort of throws people. People who are you know, school boards and zoning boards for example, are very frequently are elected, elected positions. And it's just that the IRS defines school board decisions, zoning board decisions as not being, um, not being legislative bodies in nature. So there are, and um, similarly, you know, the president is an elected official, but most of what he's doing is regulatory in nature. So um, that's one aspect that very often throws people is when they try to look at it from that angle. Uh, so let's look. That was a good. Thanks, Andy, for um, thanks to everyone who wrote wrote examples and who uh, added their thoughts on that. Um, so the next one here, similar on the same piece of um, electric meeting, metering HIA. Let's say State Senator Jackson calls the author of the HIA and asks whether legislation would be useful to create such a, a statewide program. Would it be lobbying for the HIA author to talk to Senator Jackson about um, 
legislation creating a statewide program. If people want to chime in in the little, little chat boxes. Is any? I think we have someone writing. Yeah, Michelle's got a really good answer. Michelle, do you want to chime in and explain a little bit more about what you're thinking here? Um, yes, hi. Uh, well, I guess I was going on on the request from legislators or, or a committee to learn more about the HIA and about the project that you do. And so, um, maybe having dissemination of the, of the information for educational purposes, you may respond by um, giving um, information to them, like your summary, or uh -huh. but not but not really express a position on it. Yeah, I mean, I think th I think that's a good way to start. Is that if you're able you're able to provide background materials that you've already created for the State Senator that you've already distributed. This is a perfect example of a time when you want to have distributed your materials widely. You can give already created materials to Senator Jackson, and Jackson could, uh, you know, use those to consider how a statewide program would be useful. If you, if you talk to, you could, you could talk to a state senator and talk just in generalities about the policy issue. If your HIA is not talking about, you know, this is about electric metering, and you're, you could talk broadly about um, electric metering in your state and the possibilities of what it could accomplish. But as soon as you go beyond talking about the general policy of electric metering to talking about specific ways, specific, you know, what legislation would look like to be helpful in specific ways, that's going to be referring to specific legislation, and you're going to be reflecting a view on that likely. So it's the kind of thing where you could have an initial conversation, but as Michelle says, it's going to very quickly delve, delve into the type of, of legislation that would be helpful, and you're going to want to have just give them prepared materials. So last question here. Let's say Senator Jackson asked you as the author of the electric metering HIA for some examples of legislation that other states have implemented to successfully create smart metering mandates. Any thoughts as to whether that's a lobbying or non-lobbying? And thank you for so many people typing right now. I'm looking forward to getting all the responses. It's always more fun the more interactive people are.
So it seems like we're getting a panoply of answers here that range from just give prepared materials to get an official technical advice request from the committee. On this one, if you're saying there's a very fine line here that you, to walk, it's not lobbying if you say, here's a list of all of the states that have adopted smart metering legislation without saying anything at all about those states. If you're saying, OK, these 15 states have adopted legislation, and that's it, you can give that to Senator Jackson. But if you're providing examples of which ones worked well and which ones didn't work well or which ones had a particular problem, you know, Iowa's smart metering mandate lacks this issue or Massachusetts ran into this problem with the way their bill was written, that then reflects a view on specific legislative proposals. Because you're saying to that Senator Jackson, you know, there's 15 states that have adopted it. These four states didn't do it well. These three states did it particularly well. Any of that is going to be viewed as lobbying um, when you provide that information to Senator Jackson. So let's talk about uh, paid sick days HIA now. So here's a nonprofit conducts an HIA on Senator Smith's bill to require paid sick days in the food industry. And it talks about, you know, basically, if you imp implement this bill with, you know, these requirements, you're going to prevent so many diseases and have such and such an impact on workers' in income. And if you include these provisions in the bill, you're going to change the, you know, impact on disease spread and workers' in incomes will be affected differently. So let's say that the nonprofit knows when Senator Smith is going to introduce uh, his bill, and they want to release their HIA the same week as he's introducing his bill, and they want to say at their press conference that they think the legislature should pass his bill. Is that lobbying to release the HIA the week that he's introducing his bill and uh, have a press conference saying they think the legislature should pass the bill? If, his, if the HIA here talks about specifically about how this bill is going to impact people. Let's get a couple of uh, more responses in here, and then we'll talk to some of the people who wrote responses. All right, who is it that's writing under a health impact project lobbying one of our part two? Do you want to take a crack at why you think someone from the, so is that Jane Marshall? Jane. Jane says that it's definitely lobbying if the nonprofit says whether the bill should pass or not. Do you want to explain a little bit more what your response was, Jane? Or are you on, you're not on the phone, it sounds like. Um, folks in Maricopa County, does anyone in Maricopa County want to take a stab at this? Could you repeat Sarah, the question, I, just why we had our, our response? Yeah, what were you thinking about saying, you know, urging a specific vote is a no-no? Yeah, so in terms of the release, we weren't sure whether or not that was an issue, but urging um, that the legislature pass the bill, you know, ask for a specific yes or no, and I think that usually crosses the line into, into lobbying, so. Well, it's, it's the release that they're going to do is a public communication. There's a press conference here. Um, and it's not going to be a communication. They're not going into a meeting with Senator Smith or any of his colleagues. They're just having a press conference, public communication. Yeah, but I think uh, it was. Cross the 
line yep. into grassroots lobbying? Yeah, I mean, fine. Because the remember the grassroots lobbying, and, and thanks to the folks from Maricopa for um, taking a, a hazard on this one. You know, on gr grassroots lobbying is a communication with the public that reflects a view on specific legislation and includes a call to action. And there's no necessarily there's no call to action on this one here, where you're not they're not saying the public should contact their legislators, they're not saying who's neutral or opposed to the bill, they aren't saying what the phone number of the legislature is. They're just saying, here's a bill, here's our analysis of this bill. We think the bill would help the people in our state, and we think the legislature should pass it. So. As long as they're not, as long as it's a public communication and not a private one directly with legislators, this is actually totally fine for HIP grantees to do with non-lobbying funds. Um, this one, this next one, is one that's going to be probably more. Uh, probably all of you will encounter this, or I hope all of you encounter this problem, where the senator calls the HIA author and says, "Hey." I've got this bill written. I know that you're an expert. I know you've done this analysis. Do you think my language is going to work as anticipated? Or you know, what, what are the unanticipated effects that my bill is going to have? And the author provides some technical suggestions about how to change this or that provision to increase coverage. Is, would this be lobbying? If it's just you know, technical suggestions about um, sort of punctuation and stuff. Does anyone want to take a, a guess at this one? Well, in the sake of time and moving to Q&A, this would be lobbying. Because even though it's a technical suggestion about moving a semicolon or changing a semicolon to a comma, you're still reflecting, you're having a direct conversation with Senator Smith, who's the chair of the committee, reflecting a view on that legislation. So even though you're not saying vote yes or vote no on this bill, you're reflecting a view on that legislation and helping them write that bill, and that's going to be direct lobbying. So on this next question, I think that we've covered this one already, that if the senator asks the HIA author to testify at an upcoming hearing about the bill, but only if the author will speak in favor of passing that bill, that's going to be lobbying unless you get one of those letters from Senator Smith, who's the chair of the committee. If the senator writes that letter that has all the I's and T's dotted and crossed of the IRS rule, then it's going to be fine. It, this is totally fine as long as the HIA author gets one of those letters of uh, invitation in advance. So that's going to be the key to this one. So let's talk through this press conference and the uh, that we were just talking about on the sick, paid sick days HIA. So we said it's not lobbying if the nonprofit has a press conference saying why the bill is important and saying that the legislature should pass it. What about this? What if Senator Smith, the bill's author, joins them at the press conference? Is that lobbying or non-lobbying? Just for the first one. So Michelle is saying, no, the senator may not speak at the press conference. Let's see if we have a couple of more responses. Seems like they're coming in here. Right, it is not lobbying. Uh, Michelle, do you want to explain which, which one are you? Uh, Michelle, do you want to hop on and talk through your answers on this one? Yes. So for the first one, um, if the senator decides to speak at the nonprofit's press conference, um, I would say it would be not lobbying just because you're kind of, um, you're not the one who's doing anything, I guess, to to go in favor of something. I, I mean, I, I guess like when you said right now, um, when you have the um, your, your educational material and then you pass it on to other nonprofits or other people who may run with it in lobby, then under the subsequent use rule, then you're really not lobbying. That's how I kind of see it. 
Okay. The on, on the first part of this, mm -hmm. if the senator speaks at the nonprofit's press conference, the issue here is that the nonprofit is having a direct communication with the senator in addition to having a public communication. They're having two communications at once, essentially. The nonprofit is having direct communications with the senator about their legislation. And so and it's going to reflect a view on that legislation. So speaking together at the press conference would um, would make the um, would make that communication make the press conference a lobbying uh, activity. Um, so that would be the first one is a lobbying activity to have a senator join you at your press conference. On the se on the second one, having the nonprofit staff brief their findings for legislators. Again, if there's legislation pending on your HIA as this paid sick days HIA is, that's going to be uh, a direct communication with legislators reflecting a view on specific legislation. So that's going to be uh, lobbying. But on the third one, where the staff meets with the editorial board of the state's largest newspaper and asks them to urge the legislators, um, it, it should say, to tell them to urge the uh, legislature to pass the bill. That's non-lobbying. You can talk. You can urge the editorial board to support the legislation because that's a public communication. You're not communicating with a legislator, and you're not asking them to contact their legislators. You're just asking the editorial board to write a, uh, an editorial supporting this legislation, and you're, you're briefing them about why the legislation is good and you're giving them background information about your HIA. Rebecca raises a good question, point here. On this prior slide, if the chair of the committee asks you in writing and with all of the I's and T's dotted to, um, to make some um, particular, to provide your views on the legislation, you make uh, some suggestions. This would be fine as long as you have that request in writing on behalf of the entire committee and you're providing your insights and information to everybody on the committee, everyone who's involved. That's going to be uh, totally fine. So let's, uh, I want to keep things available for some questions as well. So let me just skip ahead. Um, on this one, Let's skip ahead to this one. This is an important issue where on a, let's say it's a revitalization project and the nonprofit that's conducting the HIA convenes an advisory team. And that advisory team includes academics, local residents, merchants, uh, staffers from the State Senate Appropriations Committee that would be funding the project that's being examined by the HIA. W what would be potential problems with, with this situation here? Does anyone want to take a stab at this one? Thanks to everyone who's typing here. Give people just a minute to Cookie, do you want to jump in and explain what your thinking is here? Sure, can you hear me? Yep, thanks. Okay, yeah, so um, because of the fact that the staffer um, would be on the committee and attending the meeting, as a specific proposal ideas are generated by the group, you would be having direct contact um, with them and then uh, doing a lobbying activity through that direct contact. 
That's exactly right. And so that's, okay. that's exactly okay. right. And it's a problem that HIAs have encountered already, that when you include the people who have the legislative authority to make a project happen, and you include them on the HIA advisory team, you wind up having specific conversations with them about proposals for funding, for example. In this case, if you know the street revitalization project is state funded, and the person from the Senate Appropriations Committee who's on the HIA team is having co communications with grant funded individuals about specific legislative proposals. Uh, so that's something that's important to think about as you're constituting your team. Um, you know, and Rebecca says, for example, what about if you're involving legislators in the scoping phase, collecting their input? It could be acceptable to have legislators, to talk to legislators in a scoping phase if it's clear that you're not talking about specific legislative proposals at that point. It gets into a tricky area because you, with, especially with legislators, it's easy to move from scoping conversations about policy in general to more specific examples of, um, you know, here's what we need from the legislation. So I want to throw up one last slide. And if you, if as we talk about this, if other people have specific questions they want to raise, let's. I'm happy to stay on the line for quite some time afterwards. We, you know, we've got a full hour and a half here blocked out. So if people want to keep asking questions, they can. But the last hypothetical I wanted to is just go ahead and put those in the chat box and I'll call on people and we can discuss things back and forth. But the last example I wanted to just mention was this example which comes up so frequently about an HIA that details legislative provisions, making sure that you're releasing it with talking points, frequently asked questions, so that organizations that are going to be lobbying on the issue can use those if the legislation is introduced, basically thinking through again, just trying to reemphasize this idea of the importance of thinking through how are your allies going to use information, what information could they, will they need as you think through an 18 month campaign timeline, um, and how, are, how can you be helpful to their lobbying efforts with your non-lobbying funds. Um, so let's throw it open to some questions here. If people want to write them into the chat box. And um, if you don't, if you're not able to stay on the call right now because you've got to run to another meeting, uh, KHI and Pew have funded office hours. So you're able to contact me directly with questions about things that are going on in your HIA and your campaign. And we can talk about some strategies of how to roll those out and how to make them as effective as possible. Looks like we have a few questions coming in right now. So Andy Andy asks about local health departments or lobbying rules different for local government. Well, that's a, I'm glad you asked that question, Andy. The, the lobbying rules that we've outlined, that I've outlined today, relate to the IRS rules. And those are from every level of government, from Congress down to town meeting and city government, tribal governments, foreign governments, any type of legislative body that an HIA is, um, you know, if the HIA is working on legislation, then those communications with legislators, even at the local level, are going to be um, are going to be lobbying under these rules. Were there, was there, what, what specifically sort of situations were you thinking about on that one, Andy? Well, I meant it a, a little bit differently, and not so much the like difference between a federal, state, or a local level in terms of legislature, um, but in terms of the, the comparison of a nonprofit organization conducting this HIA versus a local government agency conducting the HIA? It's the same as, uh, you know, the, eight, the local government as a grantee is going to be bound by these rules just as a nonprofit would. The 
added complexity for folks, and I know there are a lot of folks who are grantees from local public health departments. The co added complexity is that some state and local uh, laws may prevent, um, may impose additional restrictions on public employees from lobbying or from impose restrictions on public employees contacting legislators about policy issues. Um, so it could be that there are cases where some of the things we've discussed about talking to legislators about regulatory issues, that state or city employees might be prohibited from doing under some, some rules, where the grant r restriction would allow you to talk to some legislators. It might be that your local government rules don't allow you to do that. And vice versa, it could be that there are some things you're allowed to do under city law that, because of the way the IRS rules are written, that you're not that aren't okay. Does that sort of get to the? I know that was sort of a little bit of a vague answer there. Is that somewhat helpful, Andy? Or there? Yeah, no, it, it was. It, it, no, it was. That was helpful. Um, just because that piece of you know we do get asked to to weigh in as you know a content expert, um, and so knowing that piece about still may need that letter from a chair to be able to do that and not have it considered lobbying is helpful as long as, again, to your point, there's not some other, um, you know, uh, rules that, that prohibit that. And that's, you know, it's that example for when you're a public health employee, as you said, getting that letter from the committee chair can be especially helpful uh, when you're a public employee. Um, both because it, it may fit under the exception to a city rule uh, or a state law, and it's going to give you greater ability to talk to um, the legislators under these IRS rules. So Jonathan has a question. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question, Jonathan? Or <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, if it, so, NHI can cost like whatever hundred thousand dollars to conduct, if you trigger lobbying rules by doing something like having a senator or something at a press conference or having them at a scoping meeting, whatever it is, does, you know, basically are you throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater? Can you say, well, this meeting cost $1,000, the whole thing cost $100,000, so, you know, you know does $100,000 now contribute to, um, count as lobbying, or is it only the $1,000? It depends. And... Um, Certainly, I'm going to argue. <laughs> I'm going to argue as narrowly as possible that the IRS or you know whoever your lawyer is. Generally, if if it's a situation like the one you addressed, where you've written an HIA, and then you sit down with the legislator and talk about the HIA, you know that it's just that discrete meeting that you had that's a lobbying activity, and that you need to pay for with other money. So, for example. You know, if you write an HIA and release it publicly and then you want to, um, you know, sit down and talk to a handful of senators who are on the fence and give them more information about the bill and about the issue, that's fine as long as you charge that time to lobbying. On the other hand, if you write the HIA and You've got the you know, the approach staff director as part of your HIA drafting team. Um, that's more likely to be viewed as that the entire project was a lobbying communication. Um, similarly, when you release, you know, if you have a press conference, if you write the HIA and you release the HIA at a press conference with the senator who's releasing, who's dropping the bill on that topic. The IRS is more likely to view the whole project as being lobbying if you, you know, if you're releasing that HIA in conjunction with a senator as opposed to doing some follow-up meetings later on with a senator. So it's very fact-specific. Um, but there is, there are certainly circumstances where after you've written the HIA, you can do some lobbying. But it's those earlier times that are more likely to mix the baby in the bathwater. Thank you. But um, yeah, I mean that's the kind of thing where we should talk about 
particular circumstances. Great, thanks. Um, so Rebecca asks about regulatory commissions. If it's not IRS lobbying, are there examples where it could be state lobbying? Um, where, so basically where, H, where the Health Impact Project would say, yeah, go ahead and do this, but you'd be um, potentially having state lobbying issues. And Rebecca, what, what particular concerns would you have for the grantee there? Uh, well, there it was uh, a regulatory commission that was passing regs. It could be that they're elected officials, but I was thinking, so that doesn't trigger IRS, but it might trigger their own state uh, lobbying laws, in which case if they have other funding, um, well, I mean, even if they're using our funding as an organization, they might need to make sure to document that in their 990 as lobbying time if, for instance, they were triggering the state law. So while it's, it's kosher from our vantage point, we wanted to just not give them the idea that it's kosher all around, which I think you've been clear in this that we're talking about IRS lobbying today. I'm really glad you asked. That's a really good point. And you're totally wrong. Oh, <laughs> so good. I'm really, glad you, Even I'm really glad you mentioned it. Um, so it doesn't, if it's, not lobbying from these IRS perspectives, for these IRS rules, it's not lobbying on your 990 either. Okay. So any, anything here that's not lobbying from the IRS rules that you can use health impact project money, you don't report on your 990. However, you're absolutely right that it could, if it's lobbying under state law, so for example, a lot of states regulate administrative uh, regulatory activities as lobbying. Under, under many state laws, not the federal law, but under many state laws, uh, regulatory influencing regulatory action is the same as influencing legislation. So there's a lot of stuff you could be doing, for example, this smart metering project, where HIP funds could pay for it, and it wouldn't show up on your 990, but you might need to register and report with your st Secretary of State, for example if the Secretary of State's the one who regulates lobbying. And so you'd be saying on your 990 it's not lobbying, and yet you'd be filing a state lobbying re disclosure report with the Secretary of State saying, yeah, we did lobbying on this smart reading metering regulation. And you would tell your grantors, we didn't do any lobbying with your funds under the IRS rules, but if you're getting state money, the state money might say, you're not allowed to do any lobbying under our state definitions of lobbying. And so you couldn't use your state grant funds for that. So on those situations, I'm, I'm really glad you picked up on that, Rebecca. That's a really savvy question. So on those state regulatory issues, where is there, there's that gap where it might be lobbying under state definitions, but it's not lobbying under the IRS definitions, it's possible that your grants include a restriction that you can't lobby under state law, but almost that's not going to be the case from foundation grants, for example. I've, I don't think I've ever seen a foundation grant that says you can't lobby under the state law definitions. The foundation grants will say you can't lobby under the IRS definitions, and if you do any lobbying under the state law definitions, you've got to register and report as appropriate, as required under the state law definitions. And um, that last part, just to be clear, yeah. even if they're not using state funds, for instance, which are triggering their state lobbying requirements, they still need to notify Secretary of State or follow whatever those notification yes. are? Okay. So if you're using Pew funds, um, and this, you know, we, my firm represents Pew on all these questions. So you know, there's on these state lobbying issues. So there's a lot of times where organizations will have to register with the state and, you know, because they're using foundation money or, or because they're using any money and it falls into the state definition of lobbying, you need to register with the state. But um, it, it's still permissible under the foundation restrictions. There are some states, I I can't imagine a circumstance, but I guess it's conceivable, where a state could give a grant and the state would say, A, you can't do any state lobbying under the state definitions with our grant. And B, 
you can't do any state lobbying with funds other than our grant. That if you're going to get a grant from us, you can't do any lobbying at all. I think that would probably violate the First Amendment. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I suppose that's a, basically the bottom line is if you're getting state money, talk to your lawyer or talk to me or talk to your COO and figure out exactly what restrictions are on that money. Um, mm -hmm. Because there are these overlapping and conflicting uh, issues there. Thanks, Alan. You're welcome. Um, so, the folks from Maricopa County, you thought that you could communicate with local jurisdictions, like a county health department. Uh, a county health department has an existing executive relationship with the county government. Can you? Explain a little bit more. I think I know where you're going with this, but why don't you yeah, give a little we, bit of example? Um, where where a state health department has an existing executive relationship with that governor, a uh, county health department would have an existing executive relationship with a um, uh, county manager or the uh, board of supervisors. Uh, and so we thought that communication within those lines was yep. acceptable. To, that's another place where these um, state rules and the IRS rules are in a little bit of a contradiction. So for the IRS rules, if you're communicating with legislators about legislation, it's going to be, it, it doesn't matter that you have uh, an existing, existing executive legislative relationship there. Um, the IRS rules don't recognize that as an issue, uh, as a as a way of protecting your communication. Um, so for a grant, if you're doing a grant that's on a legislative issue, um, you can't be talking about you know, an HIA on a legislative issue can't be talking to the legislators about it. The bigger problem in that kind of situation might be that as, you know, we talked about earlier, the definition of direct lobbying is it's a communication with legislators or their staff or executive branch officials who are involved with formulating the legislation. And it could be that the folks in the county health department are the ones who are formulating the legislation. Um, so if it's a situation where the county health department is conducting the HIA and they're formulating the legislation, it's the kind of thing that we should probably talk about separately. Is, is that sort of yeah, help uh, at all? I, I or? guess the example wasn't where um, as a county health department, we would communicate directly with all the boards of supervisors or commissioners, um, but rather with the chief executive, uh, county manager in yeah. this case, who, or in, and if we were a state health department, that chief executive would be the governor. So we always, not necessarily that you can communicate with the legislators, but that you know, the state health department can talk with the state governor. And as long as you're, the only problem comes in when you're talking with the governor or the county executive in this case about legislation that they're formulating. You know, their, their county budget proposal, for example. Um, or if they're coming up with a new ordinance they're going to propose to the city council, county council. Um, that's the only time that this would really become an issue. But if you're talking to the county executive or the governor about regulatory or other issues like that, then you're on safer ground. Thanks for clarifying that. But yeah, it's not an intuitive kind of thing, and there's not consistency between the state law and the federal. Um, so Michelle, you had a question about preparing this sort of suite of examples. You were looking for. Um, what types of questions are usually presented in relationship to an HIA? Questions about funding, proposed project date. The questions really run the gamut. And it gets a lot more broad 
and a lot more specific than just you know proposed funding or proposed project dates. You know, it runs the whole gamut from what are the impacts of this legislation on different populations? What impacts if we change aspects of the legislation, if we increase the funding involved in the legislation, how many more people are going to be uh, covered? How many people will be benefited by the bill if we change, for example, the, um, the scoping of the project? How will that impact asthma rates? All of those, if you sort of think through the gamut of questions that um, advocacy groups are going to be using to, led to lobby on the legislation, you want to try to anticipate and brainstorm all those questions. What's the funding level? How will changes in the legislation impact uh, populations? What are the health consequences of doing nothing? Um, what do these communities look like? from a health perspective right now. Think through all of those different questions and create advocacy material about the bill based on the HIA that would be helpful to the community. You know, for example, uh, we've seen, and I think one of the questions, one of the hypotheticals mentioned this briefly, you can create a fact sheet about the bill and based on your health impact assessment, you know, a fact sheet about the bill that you release publicly. And that fact sheet can talk about why the bill is so important to pass and why you want the legislature to pass it. Creating those materials when you release your HIA, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about as a suite of materials. Um, you know, if you release an op-ed, if you write an op-ed from, from an expert or a community leader that's timed to the timing of your HIA release, that can be included in your suite of materials so that those folks can distribute the op-ed as an example of information about the, um, about the HIA or information about the bill. What, what sort of things were you thinking about for this, Michelle? No, it's just um, in general, like, I wasn't really sure um, what kind of questions were usually presented when you, you do an, uh, an FAQ sheet. But like you said, it, it, it would just have to, like, we'll just have to brainstorm as to what kind of questions are already out there and how can we address it with our HIA. You know, one useful thing to do is to look at, um, first looking at the issue of, you know, talking to the coalition allies who are advocates on this issue and find out, you know, what is it that, that they think they might need down the line. Survey them on what materials would be useful for us to produce um, now if we're going to release it later on. And then second of all, um, you know, in addition to what information would you find useful for releasing, you know, look at their websites and see what they've used in the past for Lobby Day or say, you know, I'd love to see you guys use, you guys worked on X issue or, or Y legislation in the last legislative session. I'd be really curious to see the materials you produced related to that so that I can um, make sure that our materials are going to address the same subject. So use past campaigns as a insight to what you can do in the future. Yes, thank you. you. You did answer my question. Great. Uh, is there any other questions? It sounds like things are wrapping up somewhat. Um, but if folks want to contact me offline, they certainly can, or they can contact me through uh, the folks at KHI. Um, but I appreciate everyone being on. Thank you so much. Yes, and this is Sarah uh, at KHI. Thank you, everyone, for your thoughtful questions. Uh, thank you especially to Alan for making today happen, um, for making it possible. And uh, we did want to let you know that we have recorded this webinar, uh, and we will be making it available via the KHI website. So uh, be, look, be looking um, for an email soon with that link so you can uh, review 
the webinar uh, if there was anything that you missed uh, and share it with your colleagues if there's anything you'd like to share with them as well. So um, thank you again, everyone. Again, if you have questions for Alan, please feel free to email us here at KHI, um, email Alan, um, and we will make sure and get your questions answered. Thanks, everyone. Good talking to you all.